Well, hello once again, and welcome to Tuesdays with Lloyds. My name is Pat Talley, Regional Director and Managing Agent Practice Group Leader for Lloyds in the U.S. Today, we bring you the seventh installment of our Syndicate Showcase Series, a monthly profile where we welcome senior executives from a syndicate's leadership team to share their perspective on a variety of topics, including current and future outlook for market conditions, U.S. business plans, threats and opportunities, and a host of others. It also provides an excellent opportunity for our audience to access the leadership team of the syndicate and ask questions during our Q&A. This year, we featured C-suite executives from Apollo, Hiscox, Aegis, Ascot, Munich Re, and MS Amlin. And today, we are very pleased to welcome Atrium Underwriters Limited, which operates Syndicate 609 at Lloyd's. Joining us from Atrium today are Chief Executive Officer Richard Harries, Senior Underwriter and Team Leader Kevin Flack, Professional Liability and Casualty Underwriter Wesley Butcher, Vice President for Business Development in the U.S., Anisha Goldsmith, London-based Claims Manager Naya Chohan, and U.S.-based Claims Manager Tom Behrman. We've added a brief biography for each panelist in the chat box for your further review. Before we begin, some quick housekeeping. Please do submit questions during the discussion, but we ask that you use the Q&A tool instead of the chat feature. This makes managing the Q&A easier on our side and ensures that we answer as many questions as possible. Today's session is being streamed live on Lloyd's YouTube channel and will be recorded. We'll drop a link to the channel in the chat box, and we encourage you to share it with any colleagues or clients you think might have interest. <laughs> Dozens of our previous sessions are also available for viewing on demand. And with that, welcome again to our guests, and let's get started. Richard, uh, let's start with you, sir, if we may, uh, and set the stage a bit. Please tell us about Atrium, its history, and its place within the Lloyd's market. Thank you, Pat. Uh, first of all, I've made sure I'm off mute, uh, which I think, so hopefully you can all hear me as well. But thank you, Pat, and thank you to all the Lloyd's team that have put this together. And um, thank you to all the listeners who are out there. Uh, we appreciate that you've taken your time to uh, hear our story. So at Atrium, we've got a great history. And actually, it's something we've quite enjoyed researching uh, prior to our conversation today. Um, our, our Lloyd's family tree can take us back to about the 1930s. Uh, we've got some American coverholder relationships, which go back over 50 years. And uh, we have a European cover holder who tells us we've been trading together for 30 years. Or um, fortunately, no one on, that call, on this call can verify that. But uh, so you can tell we are in it for the long term. We do try and be a sustainable business. And uh, there's a bit of evidence there. Um, as you said, Pat, we currently trade through Syndicate 609, which merged with Syndicate 570 in 2012. Uh, Syndicate 609 was set up by Mark Denby and Christine Dandridge. And Christine was one of the most prominent and successful underwriters in Lloyd's history. And she was an outstanding role model to many of us at Atrium. And we think we're one of the few syndicates that has never lost money on a year of account basis. So uh, something we're very proud of, um, something that puts a bit of pressure on Toby, the active underwriter. But uh, I think the key thing outside of the, uh, the financial side it just means we, we've succeeded in building something which is, is sustainable. You know, we want to be around for our clients and stakeholders for a long time. And, and financial success, being financially robust, knows we, means we can keep our promises. And you mentioned our place in the Lloyd's Marketplace. Well, size-wise, I say we're in the top 20, which basically means we're 20th, uh, but, but we're happy with that. But in terms of influence, we aim to be a lot higher. Um, you know, we are represented on several of the market committees and we really work hard to influence the marketplace. But on the ENS side, I would say we're in the top 10. So, so the people we're talking to today are incredibly important to us. And, and say Atrium today, where are we? Well, we're very excited. We're, we're back together. Uh, we can now see our clients. Uh, we're growing. We've grown 40% in the last four years, our, our GWP. Uh, we've got more staff. We've taken on about 
Uh, we've increased by about 15%, so around 25 people, 30 people in COVID, which was a challenge in itself. But we've been able to attract a much more sort of diverse population as well. So we'll be a better business because of that. Uh, and then finally, our 2022 business plan has been approved. And for the first time in Atrium's history, we'll be writing over a billion dollars worth of income. So, so all good. Thank you. Well, that's, that's just remarkable. And uh, let me say, uh, particularly, uh, it's striking to hear someone make the statement that you've never lost money. I mean, I think we all know, uh, particularly over the last 20 years or so, this business is, is uh, incredibly complicated and difficult to achieve a consistent profit. So uh, certainly want to say well done. Um, so Richard, what is it you think distinguishes Atrium particularly or sets it apart uh, from the rest of the market? That, that's a good question and something we, we think about a lot. And actually, what, the first thing that I would say is what doesn't differentiate us is that we're very much part of the Lloyd's marketplace. And we're really proud to be part of the marketplace. And, and we do a lot to make sure the marketplace works well. You know, we have a particular employee who probably spends a third of his time on, on digitizing the marketplace. Um, we really love the subscription part of the marketplace. We think that that enables us to um, participate, to manage our exposures. And, and often when you're trying to solve a client's problems, two, three, four minds are better than one. And I think it, again, enables you to be much more um, you know, sustainable in your product offering. offering. So, so the good news is be, yeah, that what doesn't differentiate for part of this marketplace and the subscription side. I think what does, um, and you mentioned it earlier, is our sort of long-term multi-generational success. I think what, what that means is that just about all the teams at Atrium that underwrite have already gone through a leadership change. And I think that, you know, there've been a lot of successful businesses that have been successful when there's been sort of a similar team in place. But what I, what I really like about Atrium is that we've managed to gone through, you know, leadership changes and maintain that, maintain that. And I think, Part of the reason behind it is because our capital has always maintained the same. So it's always been the same. So we are 75% backed by individual names. And the market now is only is less than 10%. So, and those names have been with us since the syndicate set up in 1984. So to have had the same capital providers with the same sort of ethos as us, which is it's all about profit, not size, I think that's really enabled us to to run the business as, as, we, as we see fit and um, to date has worked. Well then, then oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, sure. No, I say, so this focus on profit, not size is key. Um, the, the current differentiator, which helps is being light touch. Um, even though we're light touch, we haven't changed how we do our business. Yeah, we still plan the same way and um, yeah, we're still as thorough in our approach because you know, as you should be, light touch hasn't changed how we behave. It just make, does make life a bit easier and especially in a growing marketplace. And again, we just want to be able to keep our promises to clients. So when we say we can do something, we know we can do it and we're not gonna have external restrictions. But, and I suppose as a CEO, I would say this, but the most important differentiation is our people. You know, I'm surrounded by incredibly bright people who, who really care about what we do and, um, and like being here because, because we empower them and allow them to make decisions. So I think there's just, I think I inherited a great culture. The business is, uh, and this desire to just to continually improve it is, uh, is a differentiator. Excellent. I think uh, as we've profiled several of these uh, syndicates that uh, it, it's really helped me appreciate and develop a better understanding of just how global and diverse Lloyd's Capital is. So to, it's, it's fascinating to hear that you've, you've largely stuck to that traditional capital model of the names, which we all know the, the, how that works uh, very well. And it's, it's, to hear that's very refreshing. So uh, great, to, great to hear that history and a little bit of the uh, sort of the evolution of Atrium. Um, you know, uh, this is all providing excellent background on the on the business activities of Atrium, uh, Richard. But uh, give us a little bit of a sense of how you would define Atrium's culture. Um, 
it's interesting. We, we've sort of never had to do this because we've just liked being where we are. And um, but then about two years ago, we thought, well, what, what are we? You know, what is important to us? How are we going to? Yeah, we want to attract different people and and attract people. So we wanted to try and say, what are we? What are we? And so we actually want to be the most trusted syndicate in Lloyd's. That's that's what we, we we really thought that resonated with what we tried to do. We want to be trusted by our clients, by our brokers, by our agents, by our employees, by our stakeholders, and it just seemed to encapsulate what we try and do. And uh, uh, and to to expand on that, and to get to for, for that to work, you have to trust your your people, and empower your people, and and I think that's that's key for us that people. The way we set up is that people uh, make decisions and they're, in, and they're trusted and empowered to make decisions. And I, and I think we sort of say we trust them to do the right things and do them right. And, and, and that, that has sort of resonated with a lot of us that um, that's why we're here, because we, we, yeah, we treat people well and we respect their intelligence and we pro- provide this great environment where they can make decisions and making and, and be trusted to make those decisions so the words we use other sort of use that independence teamwork confidence self-challenging we like because i don't think an atrium person never sleeps that soundly at night because they're always asking themselves how they can do better what can they do for their clients how can they handle that broker better and i think you know they're, they're, that really res- again resonated with me about how how we're still constantly trying to improve and how that came back to us from our staff, you know, define how you feel. Well, I'm always asking, challenging myself. Excellent. Excellent. That, uh, uh, great to hear, uh, that you, you know, you set up, set the stage and let people do what they're going to do and, 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 and trust them to perform. Um, I think you had mentioned previously how important the U S SME market is to Atrium. Um, what's, what's Atrium's approach on that? Well, I think the key, what we want to be able to do is, is sort of build very strong relationships with our, our agency network. And, and, and almost by, you know, when you asked us to do this call, we were sort of talking about, you know, the, the, the senior leadership of Atrium. So the CEO, the CEO, the managing director. And actually, we all immediately turn around and say, actually, no, the, the faces we want people to see are the faces that you will deal with in your day-to-day operations. And so, yeah, the colleagues that are, that are on this call are the colleagues that are going to be building these relationships. So, again, we, we like the fact that people work for Atrium, but a lot of the relationships are built individually. Um, and again, that and, and again, people are trusted to, to do that. So um, I would say that, hey, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly important to us that the US SME and surplus lines market across all the businesses is absolutely key to atrium it's, it's key to lloyd's it's a great marketplace because we're allowed to solve problems in our way it's not admitted in the fact that you're slightly more regimented in what you can do here really the sky's the limit to come up with innovative solutions and um and i think that's what lloyd's really allows you to do and the ens market to do so yeah i think we'd be lost without it and uh, we certainly thank lloyd's for enabling us to uh, to trade in that marketplace. Great, great to hear. Um, I've noticed you've, you've uh, already mentioned uh, relationships several times. Uh, how have you coped the this past 18 months or so of you know being isolated, not being able to travel and, and, and see each other in person? Well, it's undoubtedly been a struggle. It's not natural for, for most atrium people to be stuck by themselves in a room. We, we, we thrive on being together. Um, but I think all of us, probably everyone on this call, everyone listening, is um, surprised how the marketplace and Atrium has actually you know, survived and, and probably flourished in, in, in this environment through embracing the technology. But, but we know we're missing out and we've missed out. And I was delighted that um, several Atrium people were on the first flight out of Heathrow yesterday to, to come to America. Um, <laughs> We're really keen to, 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 to again, to reconnect. Um, we got plenty of new ideas. We've got new technologies to discuss. And uh, I know um, the guys on the call will expand on that. But um, no, we, we are very excited about 
the back to normal approach, but we, we're going to learn some great lessons over the last 18 months. I think the whole business working environment is going to be fantastic going forward in this hybrid world. Absolutely. I, I don't think you're going to get any complaints from anyone that we're finally able to come out of our uh, collective caves. Uh, I, I, I think, I believe you're, you're having a significant representation at both plus and WSIA next week. And in fact, I'll be there and uh, hope to meet up with Kevin and some of the other team there while, while in uh, San Diego. Oh yes. Um, yeah. I, I think we've, um, yeah. Well, I think our, our major concern was whether we've got too many people on an airplane at the same time. I think that was the, the big, the big issue we have, but no, we're definitely attending those conferences in person, really looking forward to, uh, to, to catching up with, um, with everyone out there. Fantastic. Um, well, thanks, Richard. Uh, that, that really kind of sets the table for us, as we said, and gives us a perspective and background. Let's, let's pivot over to Kevin. Um, Kevin, many of our listeners in the U.S. will have heard of your web-based quote and bond system, AU Gold. I know I'm certainly familiar with it. Uh, I, I believe it's been around for perhaps 15 years now. Uh, tell us more about that platform and how it's evolved over time. Yeah, good morning, Pat. Uh, thank you um, for asking that question about AU Gold because it is a it's a very important part of what we do you know, on our cover holder business. And we actually need to go back to the early 2000s, which was the point in time when we realized a lot of our MGAs were handling small unit premium business that was just inefficient. You know, you had policies of $500. And the MGA might be retaining maybe 10 or 15%, same for the retail agent as well. And for that amount of money, that amount of commission, I mean, I appreciate those policy fees on top maybe, but basically within that, um, that revenue, they had to service, um, service the agent, um, basically quote the risk, underwrite, you know, issue the policy, produce the documentation, raise an invoice, you know, file the, the fees and taxes, um, report into London. And it was just too much for such a, such a small policy. So what we wanted to do was find a solution. And um, we built the AU Gold platform, which was built around the MGAs with retail agents having access. And the idea is this would allow for a quote bind reporting um, process. It was actually quite groundbreaking at the time. I mean, if we go back to 2003, 2004, the internet wasn't actually that old. And let's face it, the I iPhones hadn't even been invented. So we were pretty, we were pretty, we were in the dark ages, but we decided to come up with an underwriting platform and try and improve that process. There were two big hurdles. The first was cost and expense of building. And actually, you know, coming back to Richard's comments, this is where senior management at Atrium really backed us underwriters because we had an idea. We said, this is what we wanted to do. And the funding was there for us to go ahead and actually create something. So that was one aspect. I mean, managing the cost of an IT project is always a challenge, whatever you're doing some things really don't change. I think the second hurdle was actually convincing those in the distribution chain that this was a good idea. You know, we, we were pretty much the first portal out there. So this was quite a brand new sort of idea. And yes, there was some resistance. You know, people, people like a bit of paper. I mean, we still like a bit of paper now for working, but we, 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 back then it really was quite unusual. So, we had to convince those in our distribution chain that this was the way forward. But actually, our message was, you know, be efficient, give better service, write more business and choose Atrium. And a lot of senior management at MGAs really bought into that. And, you know, even the old school underwriters that love the, you know, our oh, computer won't be able to do what, what I do. In fact, we eventually won them over as well because we said, look, carry on underwriting for us. That's exactly what we want you to do. But we want to take away the administration. You know, we're not paying you to be glorified administrators. We want you to underwrite, decide on the risk, but let the, let the technology take away the, the admin. It actually worked and it, 
has been hugely successful um, ever since. And what we've done is we've expanded the products. Um, we have got products across property, casualty, um, professional liability, um, accident health and aviation. And it's also live, not just in the US, but Canada as well, and also in the UK. So it has been a huge success. It's a really long story. I could spend a whole hour talking about it. <laughs> Hopefully, Pat, that gives you some background. No, that's a great summation. Like I say, I've been familiar with that product and, and the way that it's grown and, and, and proliferated. And, and I guess the sky's the limit. So great way to, to, to sum that up, uh, Kevin. Uh, I think this probably provides a good segue for us to turn to Anisha. Uh, and find out more about how Atrium is operating in the U.S. and how this ties into AU Gold and sort of the, uh, the you know, the wider syndicate uh, ambitions. Well, thanks, Pat, and thanks, Kevin, for teaming me up. Um, you know, you've heard from Kevin now about the origins of AU Gold and how the project got off the ground. But uh, to be quite honest, the whole AU Gold initiative involves a lot more than just building a website. Uh, we've opened a U.S.-based office in 2010 titled ARMS, Atrium Risk Management Services, and built a team to support MGAs in their use of the AU Gold platform. We now have a team of staff performing various functions uh, from customer service, exceptional underwriting, data analysis, marketing and business development, and claims handling. The entire operation is centered around our MGAs and their needs. So in terms of wider uh, syndic syndicate ambitions, uh, ARMS gives, gives us that ability to raise the profile of Atrium and deliver our strategic goals in the U.S. SME space. Well, it's really good to hear about your establishing a, a, you know, a, a, a bricks and mortar presence here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly speaks to Atrium's strong commitment to the, to the region as a, as a major market for them. Um, mm -hmm. what's, what's been the impact of uh, ARMS on Atrium's business and, and, you know, perhaps give us some thoughts about the future, uh, particularly since I know that you've only recently joined Atrium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, if we summed it up right now, uh, the impact is positive. The word is positive. Um, the setting up of ARMS has really changed the way Atrium engages uh, with our distribution partners. Uh, typically Lloyd's underwriters liaise with senior uh, staff within MGAs, but our business model of supporting uh, kind of the frontline underwriting staff at the MGAs on their day-to-day -day business and on the same, same time zone has uh, reaped huge rewards. Um, it's put Atrium on the radar. Uh, it keeps us in the minds of those who decide where each individual risk should be quoted. Our visibility, our ability to deliver a message and our opportunity to build personal relationships. Um, it's a people business, not just for Atrium in London, but also in every step of our distribution. Uh, and we wanna help with that. My role really is to make sure that our partners have a seamless experience from our platform to our products, to our people. And so in, in terms of the future for ARMS, I think that there is a desire to maximize our unique position of being able to build strong and profitable partnerships within our MGAs. Uh, when Atrium asked me to join, there was certainly ambition in the direction of the platform and the portfolio. The syndicate wants to grow its surplus lines business by enhancing its capabilities. So Atrium is also keen to raise the profile of AU Gold, promote what we can offer and maximize on our opportunities. Uh, I think most telling about Atrium is that uh, we are empowering our staff. Uh, and for my part, that allows myself to use marketing and underwriting background gained from domestic markets to help take Atrium and AU Gold to the next level. We're going to be focused on engaging our partners, uh, retaining their business, making sure that we can do whatever we need to do so that their needs are met, and also development, development of our products, our platform, and our people. That's great. A great story. And uh, it looks like uh, much more to come. Uh, thanks, Anisha. Uh, let's let's jump back to Kevin for a minute. And I was going to ask, uh, you know, what does the future hold for AU Gold and technology within uh, within Atrium's business? Well, one thing for certain, Pat, is technology never stops moving. And from my 25 years in the business, I would say the pace is at its fastest ever. 
Just going back to um, what comments I made earlier about our timeline with our platform, the one thing that really did follow in the late 2000s and into the 2010s was that other carriers started producing their own portals. And now every carrier's got one. So it actually creates a bit of a problem. As much as that's great that the industry is trying to be more efficient, the problem for NGAs is there's just too many portals. So what we're now seeing is a different kind of a trend. We're seeing MGAs building their own system and basically using API technology to, to basically bolt in products from carriers. And that's really where we are now with our platform and the direction that we're going. Um, we have built API connectivity. Uh, we actually went live this year with an MGA and the MGA can quote and bind risks within AU Gold, but without actually going into our platform. So we've got real-time APIs that are, are running against our underwriting rules, eligibility. Um, it's running against other metrics that we have that generate the, the, generate the premiums and things like that. So we're very excited that we managed to reach that milestone and we can do APIs on a quote or a full buying basis. But it's also worth mentioning about how APIs are, are changing the way carriers are operating. Um, and we're no different. 2018 was when we first um, adopted API um, for third party data. And that's something that now is becoming a bigger part of underwriting. And we started out with ISO and we used API to get certain um, property characteristics built into our, our underwriting. So we're automating that information and making that part of the pricing and eligibility sort of process. But API is it's also moved on a lot from that as well. And what for us, for Atrium and our sort of US binding authority book, one of the key things for us was the aftermath of the California wildfires. I think we all know 2018 was a, a real sort of watershed moment, as it were, in terms of how the industry viewed wildfire risk. Um, obviously, there were huge events um, late in that year. And it surprised us as, a, as much as it surprised all the, all the other carriers writing in California. But what it was, was a wake up call. And we've used API um, connect, uh, connectivity to actually basically assess wildfire risk, to price it, to basically calculate our eligibility. And we've had success already from actually give, protecting ourselves as a carrier, but also being able to also offer insurance to those that need it that may still be exposed, but we've managed to remove some of the exposure that would otherwise make it impossible for us to write in the state. Well, fascinating. And then while we're, you know, while we're on the topic of uh, technology, I mean, outside of AU Gold, maybe tell us a little bit more about how Atrium is embracing te technology uh, generally. Yeah, sure, Pat. Sorry, I'll, as I say, I can talk about AU Gold all day, but there's actually a lot more going on at Atrium than just the platform. Um, I would say innovation really is, it's become a cultural part of Atrium. And what I mean by that is we actually have our own um, innovation committee, uh, which is chaired by my fellow underwriter, Simon Lewis. And what that committee does is, is it's a group of people at Atrium across different areas of the company. And they're looking at internal and external sort of initiatives that can help improve us as a business. Um, so, in, so internally, it could be data. Externally, it could be brand new product. Uh, for example, one of our teams um, released a new product for uh, cryptocurrency. So these kind of, it gives us that opportunity to explore sort of brand new ideas and see what we can do to, to help the business. But also at a market level, um, you know, Richard mentioned earlier about how Atrium is engaged with market initiatives and very active in playing our role in, within Lloyd's. And actually innovation is no different. Um, we support and mentor some of the insure tech startups within the Lloyd's lab. Uh, we've oh. certainly enjoyed being part of that. 
and um, we, we've had one or two, or certainly one that's come to fruition. Um, but we're, you know, we, we enjoy being part of that sort of creativity and trying to bring in initiatives to to the market. There's also another market level initiative that we're involved in, and that's the product innovation facility, uh, which was set up by I want to say around 28 Lloyd syndicates, uh, fully supported by Lloyd's, which we appreciate. And it's basically a, a sort of a, a knowledge exchange, but also a forum for exchanging ideas and to tackle perhaps new and emerging risks. But really, the PIF and the Lloyd's Lab, are, are, I think that they're, they're so great because it's putting Lloyd's back at the forefront of, as I say, new and emerging risks, but also creativity, trying to deal with the market need. Um, so I think it's all positive. So. Pat, not just say you gold, there's loads more going on as well. Well, I'm glad to hear you reference the, the Lloyd's Lab and the product innovation facility. I think we've seen over the last uh, many months just how, you know, how valuable and productive they are in developing and, and incubating innovative solutions to some very real challenges that have, some of which have just popped up over the last year or so. So that's, that's fantastic to hear that engagement. Um, Let's maybe uh, pivot over to Wes for a moment and uh, talk about uh, uh, professional liability and get a perspective uh, maybe on how technology is playing a role in your space there, Wes. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Pat. Um, so Kevin's earlier comments really resonate with us, just trying to improve efficiencies and take cost away from our agents on, on that really small business. Uh, then on the larger stuff, larger risks, you know, we're using some third party data sets and better data infrastructure generally just to supplement some of the existing underwriting um, we've also been developing some new kind of pay per use pay on demand products in partnership with some third party um, industry software uh, which it, that software being used by by different different groups so that's uh, pretty creative we think um, so lots going on so we're always looking for different ways of doing things and improving the existing processes for sure um, but what I really want to stress is that you know there's always going to be a place for that human underwriting expertise across the account just because the, the nature of the account means that you know we're incredibly reliant on human underwriting to deliver the the, the, the right coverage to, to their customer base so the challenge for us really is to marry up the people with the right use of technology and, and that ethos of performance that, that Richard touched upon, you know, within Atrium, it, it flows all the way down ultimately to our MGA. So if you're good, diligent, skillful underwriter with a great business plan, then it's within our appetite. We will probably want to do business with you. Um, then our job is we'd expect to give you the, the right tools to allow you to sort of flourish and grow a successful book. It sounds very entrepreneurial and, 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 and a lot of freedom to, to operate and, and, and produce. That's, that's, I think your point is very well made about, uh, you know, technology can do amazing things, but that human element uh, and, and uh, intuition, intuitive uh, element, uh, it can't be, uh, can't be done away with in this industry. So it's, that's great to hear you reinforce that. Uh, great. Thanks, Wes. Um, you know, of course, this uh, business is not just about uh, underwriting. It's also about, uh, of course, paying claims. So, uh, Naya and Tom, uh, perhaps we can bring you in and ask you to talk a little bit about uh, how technology is changing the way Atrium handles claims. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Um, so in the claim space, we've um, at Atrium had a, had a lot of success supported by innovation and technology. Um, we're really proud of the fact that in 2019, the, claim, um, the claims team won the Cuthbert Heath Award at the Insurance Insider Awards for using um, aerial imagery through McKenzie Intelligence Systems and, um, and various other publicly available data sources, which supported the fast settlement of claims. Um, this was following the 2018 wild, uh, California wildfires that, that Kevin mentioned. Um, so we, you know, with the use of that data and that analysis, um, it gave us the confidence to coordinate and communicate um, a very proactive response in pre-adjusting claims, even before they, they were reported to us. Um, and if I pass over to Tom, um, he, can, he can explain in a little bit more detail how we paid those claims a lot faster than, than we used to. Sure, let's just stick with the California wildfires. Um, uh, we're going to compare the wildfires in 2017 
with the 2018 wildfires. For the wildfires in 2018, we partnered with a global company called The Tess, which is a payment facilitator, and we trained our adjusters on how to use their platform to expedite payment. So when you compare the 2017 wildfires to the 2018 wildfires, we found that the use of the test had reduced the average claim life by half. Um, with respect to other payments, such as invoices, uh, uh, settlements, we, uh, our continuing use of the test has reduced uh, the payment time from weeks to days, uh, possibly even one day, uh, which is incredible. Um, our, our use of the test has reduced the need for double keying uh, which is kind of a side of it, uh, issue, but a very functional one, and has also reduced the need for lost funds. Uh, given the very positive impact uh, the use of the test has had, Atrium is now working with other syndicates in the market uh, on using the test as well. Uh, Naya, would you like to mention the Lloyd's Lab? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. So, um, again, I think Kevin touched on this. We um, Members of the claims team have also um, been involved in mentoring um, a couple of companies as part of the Lloyd's Lab. Um, and one example um, is Fields Pro Direct. They use uh, technology to match claims with licensed professionals to make sure that um, there's the right fit of um, adjusters handling the claims at the, at the right point. Um, this obviously improves um, you know, the speed of service for our, for our customers, for our policyholders, um, the quantum and the reserve information that's coming back to us as claims handlers, and ultimately the claims expense for, um, for us as underwriters and, and our clients. Um, and then moving on from that, you know, we're, we're using Fields Pro now on, on AU Gold. Um, Tom, do you want to you know, touch on the other company that we've also mentored? Of course I do. Uh, up next is Tautona. Tautona is an AI programming company that we've been mentoring. Uh, the, the issue is that policies are often written for complex risks. They're often hundreds of pages long, and they're often subject to multiple mandatory endorsements that change over time. Uh, so the point is, it takes a relatively long period of time to review these policies, to understand the coverages, and to understand where the cause of loss fits. Uh, using Tautona's uh, AI of natural language processing and natural lang language understanding, we could review the claims notifications and identify, identify the approximate causes of a lot faster. Um, initial testing of the a, on the AEGO pro, program has been very positive and the claim analysis continues to increase in speed and accuracy. Uh, we're excited about the future with Tautona. Wow, it <laughs> sounds like a huge amount of work and collaboration uh, has been going on in the claim space, which uh, that is excellent to hear because it, it certainly fits in with the template where, where Lloyd's as, as, a, as an entire market has focused a significant amount of time and resource to, you know, to truly raise the bar on claims and to enhance overall speed and efficiency of the process. And I never cease to be amazed by some of the technological uh, applications that are out there to, you know, when you, when you tell someone, you know, we're pre-adjusting or paying a claim before many cases where the insured may not even know there's been a loss. That's just almost hard to fathom, but I know it's, that's, that's the state of the art. So great stuff. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about uh, technology, but uh, that's, you know, that's not just what Atrium is all about. Wes, uh, some of your audience may associate Atrium with being uh, a fairly traditional in its pro approach to business. So how would you, how would you respond to that statement? Well, well firstly, thanks Pat for, uh, for, done in that question to me as uh, being traditional um but you know you can you can get a sense from everything we're talking about that there's a lot going on on the, on the tech side um and we think that's basically going to future proof the business but we have been around for a long time as, as richard started with and we plan on being around for a lot longer still so we take a lot of pride in the history and been able to look backwards and see how things played out should definitely be viewed as a good thing, uh, particularly on liability business, of course. Um, and, and I personally have a lot of fun pulling out some rating manual that we used on the program back in, you know, 1978 on some niche professional class and seeing if we can use any of that IP to help us in today's world. Um, historical data, of course, is hugely valuable. And when you've been leading professional lines for as long as we have, Again, you've got a lot of good data to fall back on. So one of our main challenges is how do we mine that data efficiently and, and use it uh, to, to help us to move forwards. 
So then it's really just thinking about new products or new distribution methods. And, and that's why, you know, we have some API connectivity on our online products, for example, or it's why I spend a lot of time with, with new insurtechs through uh, the Lloyd's Lab or InsureTech New York, trying to be creative, finding some new and different distribution partners. Um, because if you look at any of our partner MGAs over the years, the one thing that they all share in common, regardless of their technology capabilities, is that entrepreneurial spirit. And that's going to continue, of course. So I, I, I just suspect that, that many of the newer entities we, we trade with um, are going to be much more about the tech than perhaps they were previously. So, yeah, that's a, a long way of kind of answering the question. You know, there's elements of tradition, Pat, for sure, but um, very much our thoughts on the future. You know, you, you've referenced uh, several core values that you've mentioned. Uh, how, how do you think that those uh, serve to maybe differentiate Atrium's offering from others? I think for, for, for our team, it can really be seen in our speed of both decision making and servicing. And that's really a result of our underwriters um, independence. That, that value gives us just, just great agility. You know, we correct, respond, re-engineer programs. We don't just simply jump in and out of classes. Um, another major differentiator is our very close alignment with, with our claims team, um, with Naya and Tom and, and, and my other colleagues on that side, and also our TPAs and law firms that, again, we've been dealing with um, for many, many years, so lots of those relationships go back go back decades as well, and they've done a fantastic job over the years. Um, so finally, yeah, I just say it's about the teamwork, enjoying working with good people, both internally and externally. Um, and I've been working with all of these colleagues on the call now that um, we've all got a pretty good handle of uh, each other's risk appetite. So if if Kev, for example, says you know where's you should talk to these folks about their truck brokers, E and O opportunity you know the chances are it's a good fit and it's a good conversation to be continuing with uh, Naya do you have anything to uh, to add to that yes yes I do thank you I'll, I'll jump in here as well because um yeah completely would reinforce what Wes has said a, a, about alignment and and for us um it's the consistency of our response and our service and and like Wes has said that's come from you know the number of years that that we've worked together and and, and the number of years that I've worked on 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 the respective books for for Kevin and, and Wes um so there's a very close collaboration and a communication between between the claims and the underwriting teams here in London and then between London and the US um that that goes to understanding the products the wordings the intent behind the um, you know, we're involved in meetings with the agents and with brokers. Um, we attend the conferences with, with the underwriters. So, so all of that, all of that teamwork builds trust and confidence. And, and, and I think that, that that leads to the consistency in the approach to our claims handling, in the decision making, in the reserving. And, and again, all of that just, just allows us to develop, you know, really efficient and creative claim solutions for the business. Excellent. Uh, Tom, do you have anything you'd like to throw in there as well? Yeah, and we push ourselves to continue to challenge every part of the claims process, together with many of our longstanding service providers, to improve the overall customer experience, the claim outcomes, and the reduction in claim expense. Well, all, all good stuff, as I've said before. So this has been uh, fascinating. We have uh, maybe one more topic I wanted to throw out before we jump to the Q&A. Uh, 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 it's a topic we hear more and more about every day, uh, environmental, social, and governance, or ESG. Uh, Richard, maybe give us, a, tell us a bit about how Atrium is working toward a, a more sustainable future. Well, as you say, Pat, that's a very big question. Um, I would, we could spend a lot of time on it, but the way I, I see it, at Atrium, we've, um, we've really got three prongs of, of, of how we look at um, in particular, the, the, you know, the climate crisis. The first one is what we should do as a business ourselves. And so how we behave as a business and, and decisions like that is carbon offset on business travel, uh, making sure that um, you know, we, we behave and travel and you know, responsibly. So, so it's really how HR behaves as a corporation. 
our next responsibility is to make sure that we are financially secure enough to be able to pay our customers um, out as a result of climate change. Yeah, we know that there is increased severity in losses. You know, that's not, that's, that's, that's a known. And so we, it, this shouldn't surprise us. And therefore we should be you know, financially able to pay, pay our clients following a loss. And, and following on from what Tom and Naya says uh, is to pay them as quickly as we can. And, and the investment we've put into that is, is absolutely key. It's embarrassing that I can pay, I can pay everyone on this call by the end of in about an hour's time. And we can't pay our claims in, in days, which, which I know we're working very, very strongly on. And then the third is actually to work, on, work with our clients on, on how they transition to the greener economy. And, um, and that when it, this is when it probably gets more emotive. Um, we're working very closely with Lloyd's on, on um, you know, the one could call, I think Lloyd's used the words harder to abate um, coverages, but, um, you know, people still need their lights on. They still need um, to be able to travel, but we have to be working with those clients to, to help them transition. And um, I think that's a key responsibility for Atrium. So, as I say, we're looking at it in three ways, what we do as a business, making sure that we can pay the claims when they come and how we can help transition clients um, on their green on their green journey. And, and we also, you know, the, that's the sort of E part, the S and G is also crucial. And again, you know, we want to ensure clients that are responsible, have great governance, are very aware of their communities. Um, and so, you know, we look at we look at all those things, but it's uh, it's obviously at the top of our agenda. There's been a very big um, climate change conference in Glasgow, so it's certainly in our news a lot, and um, and it's in our yeah you know, our people, yeah you know, yeah you know, our people are very aware and concerned, and um, we should make sure we do everything we can. Great, and I, and I've not uh, that's the first time I've come across a, a, a complete uh, carbon offset for travel. That's 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 very admirable. Admirable. Um, uh, well, I will say we started that before COVID, before people think we're, um, no, this is something we've, we've, we've had in place for a few years now. So we, we try and think ahead. Sure, sure. Um, that's always a good idea. Um, I think we now we're going to jump into some of the questions. Uh, we've got uh, several coming into the queue here. Uh, I think this one I'll just direct at you, Richard. Uh, uh, the question is, given the market results for 2016, 17 and 18 and that they were you know, basically not good. Uh, how did Atrium fare in those years? Well, I'm pleased to say we were profitable in all those years. Um, you know, we can't beat the market. Yeah, we, we beat the market conditions, but um, to, to remain profitable. And how do we do that? Really by risk selection um, and, and shrinking. You know, you know if, if, the, if, if there aren't the risks to write, which we think are profitable, we, we, we shrink and we're allowed to shrink. And again, that's the empowerment we get from our names that we can give to our underwriters. So we have, I'm delighted to say we've outperformed, but I'd rather we outperformed a good market than outperformed a bad market. So, um, but we have, you know, we've, we've got through it and, um, and, and now, we're, now we're growing. But yeah, I think the market didn't perform very well. And, um, and mainly, but mainly, I think, because they were growing into the wrong lines of business. But I'm pleased to say that Atrium, did make a profit in those times. Okay. Um, another question uh, is uh, to you as well, Richard. Uh, what is your counsel to young professionals coming into the industry today, especially for the future, uh, uh, for the future and retaining and growing talent? Oh, I think it's a really exciting time to be in our business. Um, I think there is, I mean, I suppose I'm slightly biased, but I've always enjoyed the fact we take risks and taking risks is really exciting. And, and what we've found is that it hasn't really been well publicized, our industry. And Nair, who's on the call, has done some fantastic work recently uh, by um, bringing people into Atrium who had never considered a career in insurance. And their eyes have just been lit up by what we do. I mean, you've heard of all the exciting things that are happening on this call, whether it's through technology, whether it's through product design. You know, the world will always need insurance. And, and it covers so many facets of you know, you're a lawyer, you're an actuary, you're a negotiator. You know, all these things are rolled into being a very good insurance person. And, 
and then alongside the sort of change in working practices and and the you know the hybrid world i wish i was starting my career again i think it's a it's a great time to be to be in and i would yeah i think it's part of our role all of us on this call all of us listening to encourage people to join join this business because it is exciting it's great to hear optimism like that um, next question, are, uh, are pricing and terms and conditions hardening well in the lead up to 2022? Um, is this for me? Or I can... uh, you can take that if you'd like, Richard. Or, or well, I'll give it to Kevin. He's taking his microphone off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, I mean, we are seeing a tightening in the market. Um, what we do see, and this is probably the benefit of Atrium having so many different lines of business and a great spread is we see different parts of the syndicate's portfolio changing in terms of market conditions at different times, you know, whether it's aviation or marine or DNF property. To be specific about the sort of the surplus lines business or, or the, um, the, the sort of um, binding authority business that, that, that we write, um, we're still seeing that market harden uh, we've seen terms tighten, rates going up. And I would say that in terms of sort of, you know, come back to climate change, you know, we've seen so many cat events in the past five years, wildfires, storms, flooding, that's having an impact on pricing. You know, that's how the industry is currently responding by increasing rates, increasing deductibles. But we're seeing general tightening um, in other areas as well across um, North America. Um, and we're also seeing casualty tightening as well. So I think for 2022, from a sort of SME perspective and a binding authority perspective in the US and Canada, we, we, we've seen a tightening of terms and increase of rates. But I'm happy to hand it back to um, Richard if you wanted to talk more about any of the other lines of business. I think that's answered the question the audience wanted to hear. Um, you know, when a market loses money, it, it corrects itself. Um, and then on top of the various other work, things that people have read about, whether it's social inflation, increased risk loss, actual inflation, um, you know, we, we, we have to recognise those uh, as a marketplace. Okay, uh, another question. Uh I guess to you, Richard, what is Atrium stamp capacity for 2022? Um, I think we're, we're at 650 million pounds, and that is after, after brokerage and acquisition costs. So I think the number we're most excited about is the fact that, um, yeah, we're right, this billion dollars worth of GWP. We've never really measured ourselves by it before, but I think if you hit a billion, it's probably worth mentioning. I think when I started, we wrote about oh, the equivalent number would have been about 60. So um, it's been quite a journey over the last 25 years. Um, so we're excited to be growing. That's, that's, that's the main thing. <laughs> Definitely a good thing. Uh, I've made time for maybe one or two more. Uh, uh, another question, how is the morale in the Lloyd's market as people come back to the room? Gosh, difficult to answer on behalf of the marketplace, but I can say that at Atrium, it's fantastic. There's a real buzz. And um, and I think, yeah, if you do walk through the room now, there's it's beginning to sort of get that feeling. Um, it's a very exciting marketplace. You walk into that room at the end of December and you you, you can feel the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the trading happening. And so it is it is coming back. Um, and but but all I can say is that, that at Atrium, it's um, the morale is so much better we're now all together. Great. Uh, one, let's try maybe one more uh, on the issue of names, which we uh, uh, touched on. Uh, do you know how many names current, uh, Atrium currently has today? Well, fortunately, I was able to um, phone a friend on this one, and um, he tells us we've got about 1,100 names, and some of them are... Uh, corporations but 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 yes yeah, so we've got uh, yeah over a thousand individual names and and just another point about names how when we train our young underwriters it's not some faceless corporation that's going to lose money if we make mistakes 
it's actually someone who might have to sell their house, might have to take their children out of school. And, and it always resonated with me that actually this is, you know, it just makes you sort of care that much more that um, there's this personal connection to your decision making. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I think uh, we are nearing the end of our time uh, to close. And uh, Richard, I want to give you the opportunity. Do you have any, you know, closing thoughts you would like to to leave us with today? Well, first of all, to thank you, Pat, for um, guiding us through the uh, the journey. Um, to thank all my colleagues on the call who are. Uh, again are all fantastic ambassadors to uh, for, for atrium we're all looking forward to seeing you in person um, at the various conferences so at plus and wsia um, and we're really you know very excited we've got a good team of people coming over and a big thank you for um for all those people who have listened to us and to uh, to anthony for all the questions so uh, thank you very much Okay, well, Richard, uh, Kevin, Anisha, uh, Naya, Tom, uh, uh, Team Atrium, uh, let me say thank you once again for sharing your time with us today. It is most appreciated. And so that brings us to the end of our syndicate showcase for November. Uh, we hope everyone found it interesting and informative. Uh, and that will also do it for Tuesdays with Lloyd's until next month. Be sure to mark your calendar for our next installment on Tuesday, December 14th, when we will host another edition of Syndicate Showcase, and our guest will be Hamilton, which operates Syndicate's 1947 and 4000 at Lloyd's. Uh, when our session ends today, you'll receive a brief set of questions in your browser. Uh, please do take a moment to fill these out, and, and we encourage you to be as candid as you can in your comments. Uh, we, we rely heavily, almost, almost solely, on your feedback in building our content so your support is certainly most appreciated there. Uh, you can also drop us a note anytime at usevents at lloyds.com. So uh, until next time, let's keep staying connected, uh, take care, and have a great rest of your day.